Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon everyone. I'm Fadl Anab Ibrahim. I'm the deputy director of KAIS and I'll be your host and moderator for today's scholar talk session. On behalf of KAIS, we'd like to welcome you all and thank you for joining you in this session. So before we start, eh, let's begin our session dengan surah Al-Fatiha. Al-Fatiha. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin rahmanir rahim maliki yawm iddin iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in ihdinas siratal mustaqim siratal ladzina an'amta 'alaihim ghairil maghdubi 'alaihim waladdallin amin alhamdulillah so uh, the title for today's uh, scholar talk session uh, as we have known will be experiential learning and competency based education landscape excel and today is my pleasure to bring you our guest speaker, uh, Associate Professor uh, Technologist Dr. Mak Fami bin Miskun, all the way from uh, Faculty of Electrical Engineering. So, Assalamualaikum Dr. Fami. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Thank you for accepting our invitation. So, if you all could, uh, so let me first introduce you all to our guest speaker. So, Dr. Mak Fami is currently the Dean of Faculty of Electrical Engineering and he graduated his PhD from Monash University. Uh, he has served the faculty uh, for quite some time and has joined a lot of uh, as a committee member in uh, development of uh, standards and guidelines, uh, such as, for example, for delivering TVET, um, especially on MPA, uh, for on micro-credential and so on and so forth. So uh, his latest uh, involvement in development of standards uh, in National TVET Council Governance Focus Group member. Uh, he also has shared several uh, gu uh, guidelines development, for example, MOHE guideline and curriculum design delivery for TVET and so on and so forth. There are, um, I think, that me, yeah, there's a slide, so a lot of lists there, and I would want to go through to, there's a lot of lists there. So um, with that, I would like to, to invite, eh, without further ado, thank you very much, Dr. Fami to invite Dr. Fami for to give his, his uh, sharing on experiential learning uh, and uh, special learning and competency-based education landscape, uh, as known as Excel. So with that, I uh, present you Dr. Fami. Okay, okay uh, before, let, before we start, let, uh, let me find out how to actually see presenter view. So do you still see the, uh, Full screens of the slide. Uh, boleh nampak slide, tapi sebelah tu ada dia punya display yang macam ada dia punya next slide tu. Dia ada ah, okay. <laughs> ada dua screen tu kan? I think. Okay, let me wait dah. Eh. Dia kena full screen eh? Macam mana tadi full screen? Kesini tekan kat sini. Betul, Fami ah. guna uh, dual screen eh? A presenter view eh? Ah, dua screen, yes. Oh, okay. Display setting tu, kita tekan uh, swap presenter view and slide show tu. Ah, okay. Wait there. Eh. And add slide show dulu. Ah. Okay, boleh eh? Yeah, boleh, boleh. Ah, okay. Boleh. Alright. Boleh nampak. Hmm. Alright. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you, Kais, for inviting me. Um, today I would like to share, so the, the, what you call, the series is called Scholars uh, Talk, isn't it? Uh, so instead of just sharing the, what is going on in the, in Malaysia today, in terms of higher education, I also share a little bit on my uh, interest in uh, learning. Uh, so uh, the idea is to share a little bit of the fundamental of learning, and then I will share uh, some of the what you call uh, the latest going on in in Malaysia uh, ed education landscape. So the title of my presentation today is experiential learning and competency based education, and I focus on the what you call idea, especially in UTEM. Uh, just for your information, I just share with you in the chat uh, box the invitation to. Uh, perasmian eh? uh, or pelancaran of this uh, the framework of uh, Excel we call Excel experiential learning and competency based education landscape by the ministry on Friday 
So the initially the what you call perancaran is is uh, scheduled on the first of October, and this talk is shared after that after the the what you call initiation, but uh, they got a, a bit delayed. So my sharing today will be a little bit uh, toned down uh, so that it be uh, suitable because it's before the pelancaran, before the initiation. Okay. Um, so what is uh, experiential learning and complete based education? So we are preparing for uh, what we call volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous future. So even to the extent that people have questioned whether university is uh, still relevant today or not, yeah? People can get hired at a degree level uh, job without even having a degree. This is true for some of the big company like Google and uh, you know IT company, they hire anyone who can actually perform a task even though they don't have any qualification from a uh, university degree and for some field it has been uh, uh, like that for quite a while like accountancy if as long as you have a professional certificate accountancy certificate you can already uh, work as an accountant and uh, paid handsomely at that you know and even those with a degree sometimes are not paid as much as those with a, a, a good uh, what you call professional certificate uh, uh, for like getting from SCCA and whatnot. So if that is the case, then what should we do? How do we prepare for that kind of future? So experiential learning is a uh, uh, experiential learning and competitive based education landscape. Uh, it's an initiative by Higher Education Department, uh, Ministry of Higher Education, to drive higher education providers, uh, us. To offer programs that embrace experiential learning and competency based education. So, uh, the world is moving towards this kind of uh, approach. We start with OBE, but even OBE is not enough. So, under the umbrella of OBE, we have what we call competency based education, CBE. What is CBE? So, in the end, we want uh, the what you call the graduate. To be able to do something instead of just know uh, something. So, in the landscape, H, uh, higher education provider could explore the offering of uh, there are four types of uh, what you call uh, uh, what you call ideas from uh, from the ministry, uh, which is called ideal, real, poise, and care. So, ideal focuses on industry experience and competencies. Real on research, voice on personalized preferences, and care on community. So this sharing session provide a sneak peek to Excel, and we'll discuss. So just a sneak peek; it's not going to cover all, uh, because the uh, Rasmia will be on Friday. Yeah, and we'll discuss its benefits and how HCP could implement Excel. So I will focus more on one of the four, which is ideal. It, uh, one is because it is uh, very much related to uh, UTEM being uh, Amton University. Secondly, is because uh, I lead this uh, group. Uh, I mean, uh, to develop this uh, part of the framework, which is industry driven experiential uh, learning. Okay, so this is a little bit of the background. Uh, I will skip some of them. Maybe I will talk on part number one in detail, a little bit on part two, but I don't think we have enough time for part two. Uh, and and also because KAIS already have a, a talk series on this uh, specifically on WBL, so I will not cover that that part. And uh, part three on the on how on the how yeah, and part four is some of the finding from. Uh, the ministry, uh, what do you call it? Action research on the do's and don'ts of uh, to you to I. But it's not about to you to I. We will see uh, later, yeah. 
Uh, so let me begin by introducing you the fundamental of uh, some of the things that uh, we are doing. Uh, and our core business is, is to, uh, to uh, let to facilitate learning. Okay. So if you can see, um, let us ponder the difference between no to read. Uh, versus love to read. So if you can see from the uh, slide, on our left is a kid that actually uh, learning how to uh, read, but it is very, what you call, um, in a very poor situation. So it might be that, uh, I mean, we can imagine the situation is like uh, the parents ask, uh, child, please uh, take this magazine and read it until you finish. So that in the hope that you know how to read and you love uh, to read. On the right is a picture of a mother reading, uh, what do you call uh, both together with a child. And um, which one do you think is will result in a, a child that loves to read when, when they grow up? Which one do you think? So let me actually try to see from... Uh, give me some uh, one minute because I'm... I want to open the uh... okay. um to you know, understand what is going on here. I, I think uh, everybody know the answer. Yeah, the, the expected answer is that the ch the child on the right, the picture with her mother, is expected to, you know, love to read, love reading, when he grew up. So I guess uh, everybody expect that. So what, what is going on there? Let, let us try to analyze the situation to understand what actually uh, what happened. Yeah? And then we try to relate that to uh, the topic today, experiential learning and competency-based education. Okay, so um, uh, you know the mind of uh, person consists of a lot of neurons. So looking from neuroscience point of view, we know we have some idea of how actually neuron or uh, a cell uh, in our brain fires up when it receives sense from the, you know, uh, for all from all the senses that, that a person has. So imagine a child just now, the one on the left, You know, um, and the one on the right, both got their own senses uh, alert. So they have their eyes, their ears. There's the, and do not forget there are many other type of senses. Uh, our skin also can sense, and our internal organ as well produce some uh, hormone, and that also we can sense. Yeah, and. All of them are associated together and become part of a memory. So I remember when I was a child, I am lucky to have a mother, a loving parent who actually uh, stress much on uh, what you call uh, reading and she understand a little bit on, on psychology because she uh, was a teacher. And uh, what happened was I, uh, my mother always read to me, and uh, every Saturday and and uh, Sunday, 
she will bring me to the library. Okay. And you can imagine the situation is almost like, like in the picture on the right. So when I still uh, learning how to read, she will read to me. And when I can read, she actually bring me to the library. And uh, sometimes she left me there to read. Sometimes she uh, let me, uh, you know, borrow uh, or during that time, only three books we can borrow at one time. And, you know, to the extent that uh, she enter entertained my reading so that when I have finished reading the three books, uh, you know, on the same, same day when we, you know, when we go home, I finished reading the three books. So in the afternoon, she, you know, have the enough energy to bring me back to the library to borrow another three books. So when I, uh, you know, uh, remember what I remember is, I remember the warmth of my mother when she cuddled me and put me on my on her lap while reading. So my eyes actually sees the text on the book. My nose actually smell the what you call the ink and the paper. My ears listen to her voice. But more than that, I also sense her love. So my brain actually produce a hormone oxytocin, for example, and dopamine that makes me feel comfortable and love. So all that is associated. You can imagine it's mixed up like a soup and become part of my memory. So you know what happened when I grow up as an adult? If I uh, get a cue from some of the, what you call uh, a trigger from the sensor, for example, if I look at the book, at the same time, I feel uh, cool air, like, like in uh, the the library when I was a child. I associated it with the uh, warmth and love from my mother. So the love of reading books is actually mixed, and maybe a big portion of it is actually the love that I received from my mother. So human learn without being able to separate what they perceive at one single time. So this is proven by the idea by Pavlovian conditioning. I believe all of us have learned this during a biological, biology class. So Pavlov in 1902 found that for associations to be made, the two stimuli had to be presented close together. They are referring to a bone and a bell. So he conducted an experiment where initially there's only bone. And when a bone uh, present of food, the dog will actually produce a lot of saliva. And then when we bell, uh, a ring, a ring a bell, the dog will not react to the bell. But during conditioning, if you can see from the third row of the picture, the presence of the food comes together with the bell, similar to the situation when my mother read to me, I not only sense uh, the, what you call the text from the textbook or from the, from the uh, book, not only that, I also smell the book. I also feel the hug. I also sense the warmth of my, my mother. I also listen to her voice. You know, mother voice is always so comforting. Yeah. So that all are part of the conditioning. So I am conditioned. So when I hear or get a cue of uh, from one of the what you call uh, the sense, then I cannot actually stop the other 
absence from coming, even though it's not present anymore. You get what I mean? So this is called nostalgia. Have you ever listened to a music and then suddenly remember, uh, you know, an event uh, that happened a long time ago? So that's actually what is going on. So maybe 20 years ago, you listened to a song by Britney Spears. I don't know uh, your, your preference. I used to listen to Nirvana. Maybe Dr. Dr. K. A. I don't know uh, when she travel when he traveled to the U. S. Uh, what kind of music he, he listened to? But ada lah banyak. Ah, tak ingat lah. Ada ada banyak yang di sini. So so that nostalgia is actually explained as such, you know. So that phenomena nostalgia happen. Uh, because of this, this is, uh, you know, it can be explained by, by uh, Pavlovian conditioning. So when you listen to some music that uh, you list, you often listen a long time ago, uh, it, uh, it's, uh, you know, keep being played uh, 10 for 7 on the radio. So you remember all the events that happened during that time. So imagine... Uh, uh, so, so if we read uh, until the finish, eh, he called this the law of temporal contiguity. So what important is if the time between the conditioned stimulus, yeah, as is the bell, and unconditioned, unconditioned stimulus, or which is the food, is too great, then learning will not occur. You see, that learning will not occur. So that is related to our title today, Experiential Learning and Competency-Based Education. So before we you know, commit ourselves to a certain method of learning, we need to understand and convince that that is uh, really what's going on. So this is the, the, the story. So what happened is we are the child on the left. So if uh, sometimes you are forced to learn to the extent that you feel stressed, a different hormone that makes you unhappy, makes you, you know, um, sad, angry, uh, will be like serotonin, for example, like uh, being, uh, you know, suspense and, and whatnot, being uh, excreted. And that will be part of our memory. So when you, when the, this child grow up, what forbid it is not uh, among us or among our children. He will not only remember, but he will hate books. He will hate the idea of learning itself. So I come from the background of intelligent robotics. That is my core research area. So one of the way of uh, I mean, I always, the idea is always to imitate how human learn. So that's why I need to understand how human learn in order to develop algorithms that a robot can, uh, you know, uh, be benefit from. Yeah. So one of uh, the algorithm that is similar to how human actually uh, think is or learn is a neural network. So this is like uh, the concept where we have vision, hearing, for example, smell, feels, oxytocin, and other type of uh, hormone signal comes comes in, and inside the brain, they will be associated together. Okay, so they are connected together as a package, and at the far right, we have class or categories or a package of what we remember. So depending on the input, so we can either be somebody who remember to hate to read, know to read, or love to read. Okay, so even uh, if uh, we learn from uh, biology, I, I, I think you still remember, the whole human body is all connected to the brain. So even our limbs, our arm, our legs are connected to the brain 
through neurons. The longest neuron is a motor neuron. Yeah? So whatever we do, even uh, 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 we think it as an output, like the movement of our arm will be stored in our memory. So the more, for example, if we train to kick a ball, the more we kick a ball, the more our uh, neuron will be fired up and become used to uh, the kicking and that way we learn, become better at what we are doing. So similarly to work, so uh, to relate to uh, the topic today, the idea is, is uh, if one, uh, our student, yeah, adult uh, learners, to learn to work, so we are preparing uh, our student to work. That is like the one of the main point of learning at a higher degree, right? So if they want to learn to work, so they need all the sense to make sense of how to work. So like the previous slide, you learn how to read, you use all the sense. Similarly, if you want to learn how to work, you need to also use all the senses. The more the senses, the better. So if you want somebody who, who you know, not only learn, uh, you know, uh, know how to work, but also love to work, this is already deeper than what we wish our students, uh, you know, be able to. So remember, we always want our students to know, to have the skill, to have the correct attitude. But if they love to do it, then that's the best, right? But how can we condition our student to love to work? So yes, the answer is yes. If we put them in the right scenario, they will love whatever we want them to love. Like how we can condition our child to love whatever we want them to love. Even us now, after we know all these facts, we can also trick our mind to love something based on this principle. Okay? For example, if you want to learn and to make uh, drinking, uh, uh, you know, plain water as a habit instead of, uh, instead of uh, sweet drinks, so you need to associate the drink with something that you love. Do it at the same time. After some time, you condition yourself to like drinking plain water. For example, you know when you play, you become thirsty. You play tennis. I, play, I recently started to play tennis. So there is a this uh, urge to drink. You put the uh, plain water close to you, so that is uh, the only uh, drinks that you have available. So the pleasant feeling when you quench your thirst by drinking the plain water is, you know, um, gazetted in your, into your memory as a, a what you call a reward like as a pleasure so you remember that event and you remember that the the plain water is actually very very pleasant so after a while after that conditioning then you start to sit to to try to find plain water even even though it's not during sport even though when you are eating and and on on the on the shop or, or you know, have dinner outdoor, uh, you know, outside. So slowly, you will even uh, replace the love, uh, I mean, the love of drinking sweet water with the love of drinking plain water. And there's a recent study saying that uh, oxytocin is the love hormone, but the love hormone also is uh is uh as a side effect will let you hate something else uh, because 
you know, you have a limited capacity in your memory. So if you love something uh, so much, you don't have enough space for loving anything else. So if you, have, if you love plain water, then you will start to hate uh, the sweet drinks. Okay, so it's like, uh, you know, it's one or the other. Okay, so yeah, we can trick ourselves. So now we want to trick the, our student into learning to the extent that they love to work instead of just knowing how to work. And more important than just love uh, to work is uh, from the, uh, what do you call employer point of view is whether they can uh, do the job or not. Because they, they can work, they can complete the task. So that is called competency. So we will uh, look into that uh, in a moment. So as you can see from this, uh, uh, you know, slide, we can imagine our brain like a neural network. So I say imagine because it is not uh, actually how the brain works. You're just imagining it. And it works for a computer in, in computer science, in computer application. So perhaps it's actually true for our brain, but the actual working of our brain is still a mystery uh, because we cannot, uh, mostly because we cannot actually measure. Uh, there's no way to measure how our brain uh, works uh, until now. Uh, as well as uh, it is a very dangerous area to work on, so you cannot find uh, any volunteers to actually uh, allow people to actually open up their their brain eh? and measure their brain. So that's why I I think yeah. Um, I'm very passionate about, about this idea where we can have uh, analogous, uh, what you call example between uh, neural network and how it works with uh, human brain, even though it's not uh, actually true, but it still can explain some of the phenomena that happen and that way we can make ourselves a better person, like how I explained to you. you know? And you start to understand uh, why things happen like that, why a person behave as such, why you feel angry, why, why your child, uh, you know, do this and that. And uh, after you understand, you remember the story of uh, our prophet when the angel asked, you know, after the people in the uh, in ta uh, Taif, eh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you know, heard our prophet because he just want to convey the true message. But the people in Taif throw rocks and, you know, insult the prophet. And until, you know, some of the rocks actually make the feet of the prophet bleed. So the angel comes and asks whether he should take action on the on the people of Taif and um, the prophet being the most, uh, what do you call, uh, a person who, who very able to understand human nature and, and uh, you know, the long-term, uh, you know, benefit of what he is doing, he will just say that, oh, let them be, if they do not accept my message, maybe their children will do. So similarly for us, if we understand what's going on with, uh, with uh, what, what's going on with a human, you understand our brain, we'll see and we will not get angry. You know why? For example, you know that uh, our child will sometimes accidentally uh, do mistakes, okay? Like uh, breaking the plate, during dinner uh, or spill some water. And sometimes the mistake has a big consequence, like, uh, you know, they take your marker, marker pen, and they draw pictures on the wall 
or even worse on the uh, very expensive carpet that you just bought. So if uh, uh, we as a parent do not understand this concept here, you know, how we, uh, human learn, we will get angry and school them. But if we understand what's going on with their brain, we just say that, oh, okay, our child is just not able to think yet because he has not learned that concept yet. So that is just what is going on, right? We can actually more, be more empathized if we can see what's going on. Like, for example, we understand if our child is still uh, three feet tall, we will not ask them. We don't expect them to actually able to reach uh, something, uh, you know, on the top shelf. So we will not get angry if they cannot do, do something that, that is beyond their physical capabilities. But because we are talking about brain, something that we cannot see, we always forget the fact that actually inside their brain, there's, there's no such concept yet of where to write, uh, uh, you know, the concept of whether the carpet is expensive or not. They just see yes, the carpet is the carpet, you know. The value, they don't understand. You see, so, so if we understand this, we can become a good educator, a good parent, a good human being, because we are dealing not only with uh, with our our student at at the at the, our class in the university, but we also deal with uh, you know uh, the society every day. So that is, I think, why uh, I really like this topic and why I share this idea to to the audience today. Okay, let us move on. Uh, just a little bit, uh, let's take, uh, I always practice this. I take a break for one to two minutes. So because uh, of uh, online uh, learning, I understand we need to take uh, a break a little bit. So while taking a break, let's read this uh, poem by Dorothy Law Nolte, uh, psychologist in 1975, who wrote, children learn what they live. It's a very beautiful poem, and we can also translate that to our university student learn what they what uh, uh, live, yeah, live as well, you know. So yeah, let's uh, take one minute break and read this uh, poem si silently. Okay, so what kind of uh, life that our children lead at, at home? Are we the parent who criticize our children? So let us uh, uh, see. <laughs> are, are we hostile to our, our children? Uh, get tired, you know, work uh, the whole day, go back. Our children ask a simple question or silly question. Are we hostile to them? How about ridicule? Are they being ridiculed? You know, always say, uh, you know, it's, it would become worse if we are comparing two, two of our children and ridicule one of them. How about shame? You always make them, uh, you know, shame. This has always happened, you know, you, uh, you know, malukan anak depan kawan-kawan, uh, right? Sometimes, sometimes that's happened, yeah? Sometimes even as uh, innocent as, you know, you let other people know that your, your child wet themselves in front of them. So you don't know how a, of a five-year-old will feel, you know. Kita uh, rasa benda tu kecil, tapi bagi untuk umur, umur lima tahun, dia akan rasa that is a very big thing, you know. Dia malu sangat. Uh, and then they learn how to feel guilty, right? So the second uh, column is the good thing. 
Do you give them encouragement? They will become confident. Do you always uh, tolerate with them? You know, sometimes we expect them to be like a malaikat. Waktu sembahyang, kena sembahyang awal waktu. And kadang-kadang dia tak sembahyang awal waktu, you, uh, we, we, you know, get angry. And sometimes, even worse, we ask them to pray, they, you know, delay, and suddenly they miss the prayer. We get so angry. So we must remember, it is our responsibility to ask, to ensure them to pray, but they are not, it is not compulsory for them to pray. So if they don't pray, it's not a sin, right? Uh, if, if they are not reached that age yet. So, but sometimes we forget and we get angry because what? Because they didn't look, because they don't listen to us. But actually we are not following God's actually command. We must be tolerant, yeah? We know that they are learning, they are, you know, they don't know how to be, uh, you know, punctual yet, for example. They, they don't know, they, they still are struggling with that concept, being punctual. They are struggling with the concept of uh, even God, the importance of following orders and whatnot. So yeah, we need to, to, to not tolerate that behavior. We take, we, we you know, uh, we understand that, okay, they still need time. Uh, so we don't get angry, just advise them. If children live with praise, they learn how to, to appreciate. If children live, live with acceptance, they learn to love. If children live with approval, they learn to like themselves. Imagine while reading this, I always think, how about our student? So what kind of live or life, what kind of living that we need to set, you know, the ecosystem of our, our student living so that they, they can uh, learn what they live. So what kind of situation, you know, what kind of environment? So that they can learn from just by living in that situation. Children learn with honesty. They learn truthfulness. If children learn, live with security, they learn to have faith in themselves and others. If children live with friendliness, they learn the world is a nice place in which to live. You see, they learn to have faith in themselves and others if they learn with security. So after you understand this, after we understand this, if we see somebody who really, uh, you know, um, don't have faith in themselves, very, very, you know, apa orang panggil tu? Apa istilah dia? Tidak confident eh? It's not confident. No so, self-esteem. Mm, low self-esteem, yeah. Mm. So you can imagine the, they, you know, never get praise at home and they live with, they are, you know, the love, all this while is not in the secure environment. So if we see student, we don't think them as a student, we think that they are human and their life from their born until the time you know them, we don't know, right? So please, please don't judge our student because it might be there's a lot of unfortunate circumstances that happen to them that they become what they are, okay? But we become a very positive lecturer. We see that any for any situation, we can always, using the same principle, condition uh, our student to become somebody better. If you know the trick right just now. So let me relate it to experiential learning and competency-based education. So we have four, like I've said uh, before, industry-driven experiential learning, uh, or in short, ideal. So this red one, uh, I will share with you today. 
but the other three community resilient exploration learning care uh let us uh you know uh have this sharing in another time because anyway the time is not uh, enough for for explaining all in detail personalized exploration learning boys research infused exploration learning real in short ideal is about industry driven as it names imply implies care is like community resilience so one of the example is sulam if you know sulam personalized exploration learning is a, a concept where we let anyone to explore their interests and circumstances as well for example if uh Siti Nurhaliza, for example, Datuk Siti Nurhaliza, want to get a degree to become a lecturer. He got a lot of, uh, what do you call, experience from being a singer. So, you know, from that kind of experience, surely he can be, uh, you know, a lecturer in that field, eh? in music, in arts. But can, uh, is it necessary for her to take the four year degree like uh, normal people? Like, no, I mean, normal people means uh, like the, the student lah. after SPM takes, uh, you know, go into uh, metrics. And then after that, you can imagine uh, Datuk Siti Nalaza do, do something like that. So it's unthinkable, right? So POIS, Personalized Experiential Learning, is a framework that allow us allow this kind of people to, to thrive. So it can, uh, they can personalize their learning. And finally, research infused is uh, focusing on uh, research as the name uh, actually is a uh, make sense lah, like that. Yeah? So you can imagine. Uh, so by looking at the example that I will give you on industry driven exploration learning, perhaps we can understand the other three. So uh, for this one, I am the uh, I lead this this uh, panel panelists from various uh, universities as well as uh, industry representative. A little bit of background, so we need to understand the problem first. Let's look at the red uh, red points. Common cause for mismatch includes having different expectation in higher education providers or industry in terms of their responsibilities and expectation in graduate attributes. So we, from UTAM, we understand this, right? So the industry always say that the student, what they do for four years, they come into the company, they don't know how to work. So that is common. And because of that, the second red bullet, immersive student learning experience in industries enhances student competencies, which helps them to meet career objectives. So the discussion in ideal, ideal framework is to provide uh, several ways uh, into giving student immersive learning experience. So what are the, the ways to, uh, you know, bring students closer to the industry? So, you know, like uh, the poem by uh, Nolter just now, these are all the learning outcome, right? So for our child, we want them to be confident, we want them to be patient. We want them to be, you know, uh, to appreciate. We want our children to love, uh, to feel good about themselves, to be truthful. So these are the outcome of our children. How about our student? So if we are aware of this uh, idea, and we want to mess with what industry wants. So first we want our uh, uh, graduates 
to be uh, work ready. That is number one. So what are their characteristics? They are ready for work, able to apply technical knowledge and work related, related skills to solve tasks at work. So number one, actually, men, they are competent because competency means somebody who are able to, uh, competency means ability to apply one's knowledge and skills to solve a task successfully. Okay. And number two is to match workforce supply and demand whose knowledge and skills match industrial needs. So you can be a very competent person, but there's uh, already oversupply in the industry, so you will still not get hired. So it's not only be a competent person, but also there's a still job available. Okay, so that is number two. So number three, not only you know, you have knowledge and skill, but also you have values and characters that are aligned with the need in the workplace. Aligned with the workplace culture and increase value to the organization. Okay, so this is the uh, attitude, values and characters that are aligned with the workplace. You know, sometimes uh, the values and characters that is needed to work in at, at one place is different than the other place. So you need somebody who are stern, who are robust to be a military personnel. You need somebody who are soft, who, who are, you know, uh, caring to work as a teacher, for example. So the values and characters for this uh, two different uh, job is uh, is almost opposite right so how we can have this kind of outcomes the answer is ideal industry driven experiential learning programs okay let's see this is an example of uh, some of the outcomes work related skills yeah what time now is uh, already four o'clock so i have 15 minutes left so in ideal, we all often uh, hear that we need to be able, the student need to be able, the graduate need to be able to solve complex problems. At the same time, on the right top, they need to have resource management skills, people management. So then they might know how to solve complex problems, but because they cannot work with others, the problem is, is not solved, right? We need others to work as a team in the real world. The problem is not solved if even know, even though you know all the theories. So, you know, other people from other departments might not be comfortable working with you. So they will actually make that situation makes the, the uh, you fail to solve the problem. So then what is ideal? So this is the start of the, what you call the concept. First, let, let's look at experiential learning. Learners need to be actively involved in the experience, able to reflect on the experience, able to conceptualize the experience and able to experiment on the new ideas gained from the experience in order to gain genuine knowledge from the experience. So a child reading with her uh, with his mother get more experience than a child reading alone. So the sense, all the senses are maxed out. You know, you, you trigger all input that their senses can detect. So if for experiential learning, if you involve in uh, doing what you learn, you have more experience than somebody who just, you know, sit in the uh, class and learn theory. So as you can see from the right, this is a 
conceptual drawing introduced by Cobb in the 80s uh, from the constructivist movement. Yeah? So you see learning is actually a subject that is of interest by many disciplines. So constructivists, for example, are from education uh, point of view. What we have discussed just now is from uh, what you call biology. From new, uh, and then I also share a little bit of insight of neurons. So that is from neuroscience point of view. So we, when we want to understand what learning is, we can read from many sources, from education point of view, the bigger umbrella of education is psychology and uh, Pavlov is actually from psychology plus biology and neuroscience as well helps you explain, understand. And nowadays we can also uh, learn by looking at uh, artificial intelligence field to imagine uh, what actually going on with our brain. So this one comes from education background. Uh, COP in 1980s to so introduce uh, this concept of, of uh, experiential learning. So it start with uh, one of the stars. Let's begin with the yellow one because it's, it goes cyclic. Yeah. So you have concrete experience created based on real tasks in the workplace. Created means you design so that the real tasks in the workplace become somebody, something that the, the, the student need to learn. If not, if you don't create to, for it to become something uh, to learn, then uh, it will not be structured. If it's not being structured, then it's more difficult to map them to the learning outcome of any of the courses in, our, in the program. So you need to have concrete experience first. And then the learners need to be reflective, observe and reflect. Demonstration by industry worker and reflection using work performance rubric as a guide. So uh, the learner, before being able to actually uh, learn through experience, they need to learn how to observe, how to reflect, okay? So as part of the package, they need to have that skill first, skill to learn, skill to observe. So they, uh, you know, observe their seniors, the uh, real industry workers, their supervisors, uh, real engineers, for example, and observe their behavior and then reflect. Okay, they learn how the engineer think, they learn how the engineer speak, uh, you know, all everything. Lah. And then based on the, their ability to observe and reflect, they can actually uh, extract what, what uh, important uh, uh, good things that they can learn from their uh, seniors in the workplace. And after that, they abstract, uh, they are conceptualized their observation, okay? Establish fact behind work process and phenomena at the workplace. This is the green, green uh, star. So they uh, derive from the observation just now. You see that, okay, how you, uh, how the engineer actually solve a problem. So, and the problem is actually a complex problem. And then they write down, okay, in order to solve complex problem, my, my boss at the workplace do this and that. And, uh, you know, similar with a, a child that read with the mother, a student that learned from the engineer at the workplace, remember much more learn much much more they learn the feeling you know being uh, in the stress the stress at the workplace the noise the smell the pressure so all that become part of them 
that they cannot learn when they are sitting comfortably in the classroom. All right. So uh, you, you see, that's why I bring this example uh, in the beginning to let uh, everyone uh, understand the importance of it. And finally, active experimentation is the opportunity to experiment in the workplace or simulated environment. So there must be room for them to, to test their, the concept that they learn at the workplace. So the industry, the company, the factory, for example, or the workplace, the office offices need to, to give chance for the learner to try their ideas. So if not, then they just be becoming a passive observer. So as uh, you know, as we know just now, the more senses that we do, even moving moving our hand and try uh, different ways to solve a problem, that also become part of the memory. So they learn uh, better, and the cycle continues. Okay. So let's look at the other uh, term in the uh, in ideal industry comes from the Latin word industria, which means diligence, hard work. In the context of ideal industry, is economic activity concerned with the production of goods and the offering of services. So in short, it's just any any type of uh, job out there. Industry driven experiential learning is a combination of the word industry and experiential learning. Is a learning system that is characterized by the requirements of industry. So industry play a big role and involve a significant amount of experiential learning. So if the industry play a big role, like what we have done today, but the student spend very little time in the industry, then it is not ideal. That's another uh, important word, competency. Excel, if you remember the word Excel is experiential uh, learning and there's another word competency based education. So for idea, now you know competency means uh, uh, ability to use knowledge, skill, attitude to successfully complete a task, right? So that is uh, that what competency means. It means in the end, in short, not only they know, but they also able to complete the task given at the workplace. So, um, I, uh, from the framework, uh, Excel framework, we separate the competency acquired into three categories, depending on the degree of involvement of uh, uh, what you call industry <coughs> in the in the academic program, we can acquire the student, the learners can acquire either technical only, technical and personal, or the best is technical, personal, and organizational. So you can see on the left, we have three different types as a big category, industry infused, cooperative education, and apprenticeship. So as the name implies, apprenticeship, you can uh, understand the idea is the student is actually the worker. They get paid for the job and they spend a lot of time in the workplace, 70 to 80%. And even to the extent that they are recruited by it, the industry themselves. So they don't like apply to get into the university. The industry actually employ them and then they then, uh, you know, do some arrangement to get uh, transfer credit from what they do in the industry. So, of course, if they are that kind of, they are part of the company, they are the real worker in the company, they will get organizational competency. But if they like a to you to I concept, work based learning, half half, they are not really a worker in the company, they don't have a real responsibility at the company, they don't feel the organizational, uh, what they call, responsibility that hence they cannot get organizational competency. But what do they get? They get technical and personal competency. And if they just being at a university most of the time, 
and some of the work based experience they get from the uh, problem from the industry uh, during final year project, uh, some industrial training course. So they can get the technical competency uh, as a minimum one, yeah, depending on how you really arrange them. So do you think uh, uh, your program uh, actually reach this level? So we must be uh, careful with claiming whether we have reached this level if we do not comply to these characteristics. So what time is so six? Is four eleven? So we still have time. Yeah? So what are the characteristics? Now let us reflect uh, with our program we are in now. Uh, myself, I am with. Uh, what we call Bachelor of Mechatronic Engineering. So let's see, does the curriculum involve job, task, and competency analysis? No, the answer is no. Does it include technical, business, legal, finance, communication, as well as thinking skills and knowledge at the workplace? The answer is uh, half. Half, yeah, maybe yes, yes, but not, not all. But the first one, uh, I don't think we do it, uh, you know, that in that detail. So maybe you can give uh, three out of five lah, for curriculum. And delivery and assessment. Delivery requires learners to immerse in workplace activity. Yes, no. Assessment is competency based to test whether learners can perform work related tasks successfully. So is that. Is it competency based? Competency based, do you remember? It means that the, the learner, the student, uh, need to be able to com complete the task successfully. So if he need to program some uh, something, the program must be a real uh, programming, or at least part of a programming uh, of a big program. And it must be according to the industrial uh, setting. And you need to complete it successfully. Program management involves high degree of responsibility from industrial partner. All right. So, in short, as the picture shows, industry driven curriculum delivery assessment and management. So, the purple and the red is, uh, you know, continuously play a role together for all part, including delivery. So these are some uh, the, the more detailed explanation of industry infuse, cooperative education, apprenticeship. So let's start with something that we are familiar with. Cooperative education, one of it is to you to I. I will show you an example after this. But to you to I is just one of the example of co-op education. You know about well, apprenticeship because it is also uh, a method, but it's not uh, available for higher education yet. Uh, but we are working on it so that uh, it uh, will be one of the mode of study in the future. At the moment, we can do to you to Ayla. That is the the extent that we can do. Industry infuse. We think that we have done it. But let us, uh, you know, be. Let's hold on first and see whether yes or not, as yes or no. Well, this is important to know. So, in short, this is the whole thing. Remember the COP diagram explaining experiential learning on the, the far right. It's mapped to the characteristics of the program. That allow the COP experiential learning to happen. So, and then these are the approach. And finally, triple helix platform need to be established. So it will facilitate it become a supporting structures, policies, procedures, and infrastructures need to be there so that our idea will be uh, realized. Okay, let's see some of the example here. If we have a four year degree program, 
we can have industry infused range like that. The purple indicates the industry course. So on the top left, uh, curriculum structure, we have more industry, what you call course towards the end. We can also range it like on the top right. So these are two examples. Of course, it's up to the creativity of the program owner. Yeah? So you can relate to this. We have workshop that is really uh, related to the industry. So when we teach uh, tools that is used in the workshop, let the industry choose. In fact, if you want to buy in the future, uh, facilities and whatnot, it's better if we, uh, you know, collaborate with the industry. We even can ask them what kind of equipment they uh, need and then you can buy from for them and train our student and then uh, even the industry can actually use the equipment that at our facilities. All right, so second uh, in the middle is is uh, example of cooperative education. We can have something like two you two I on the left, middle left, two years in the at the university, two years at the industry. Or we can have a cooperative education as it's in its original form. We take more years to complete. In between, we have rotation rotation for when uh, uh, uh sorry uh, i think it's just that five percent can i uh turn off the internet for one minute and turn on wi-fi eh? all right sorry so i need to stop okay bye So Dr. Uh, Pian Fami, so sementara tu maybe there is a question eh, dalam chat tadi uh, daripada PM uh, Dr. Muhammad Azman dia kata uh, Dr. Fami boleh dengar ke? Oh tak apa tak apa, kita tengok lah Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum eh. Uh, salam sejahtera to all participant. Uh, sementara menunggu uh, Dr. Fahmi kembali eh. Uh, kalau boleh semua participant boleh pada pukul 4.30 nanti. Uh, boleh buka uh, you guys punya you training uh, dalam link yang dibagi tu untuk isikan uh, cost feedback. Dalam cost feedback tu boleh sila isikan dan uh, kami akan bila dah selesai semua tu uh, and then after upon checking your attendance in Webex Uh, then kami akan proceed with the issuance of uh, itu, uh, untuk hantar maklumat ke BPSM untuk, untuk tuan-tuan semua dapatkan CPD as well as juga kita akan keluarkan uh, online certificate dalam uh, dalam e-learning nanti. Alright, so uh, this do so after 4.30 nanti insyaAllah. Alright, so kita masih menunggu eh, Pian Dr. Fahmi. So kalau sementara itu, kalau ada persoalan nak tanya, if you have any, any further question, you can ask. Uh, this is uh, extract something new yang belum lagi launched actually it will be launched this friday lah if you have seen the the dalam email um that that he he gave some 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 uh, preview lah of what is excel is all about so um yep uh, please write down the question oh, kalau katakan nak nak onkan microphone pun boleh uh, silakan ya okey baik terima kasih
So harap uh, all participants could uh, just wait a few moments. Okay, uh, PM Dr. Fahmi, dah boleh ni ke? Ah, boleh, boleh. Sorry ya tadi. Tak apa, it's okay. Mas. No problem. Tak ada masa lagi. Okay, I think uh, let me share my screen. So we have uh, about 10 minutes. Eh? So if you have any question, you can start asking lah. Uh, but let me open my screen first. Alright, so uh, let me... You know, while we have a discussion session, maybe now, let me begin sharing the example. It's already example now. Let's, let us start with industry infused. Remember, we have three categories just now. Industry infused it looks something like this. This is a real planning from uh, FKE. So we are planning to work with a, a company, uh, an AI company called SkyMind. They're interested with uh, mechatronic students mechatronic engineers to work with them. So uh, they, uh, what you call, offer a, a professional certificate. And we say to them, let us arrange it so that the certificate can be part of the electives in the third year. And in the fourth year, they can use the, what you call, what they learn from the, the their, their competency to solve industrial problem. So we actually get problem from the industry, from, from the company itself, from SkyMind, because they are actually a service provider. They solve uh, AI problem in under, under you know, other company. And uh, once that one that they can uh, share, they, they, they share it to, to become part of the student uh, title. And not only that, we also talk uh, the possibility of uh, having master and PhD project degree, and they can do it while working in in SkyMind. Okay, so before the third year, before they enroll to the the certificate course, we will expose and uh, make uh, what you call. Uh, uh, align the courses from uh, the first and second year, like for example, uh, in the first year, they take uh, computer programming, C++. So we try to uh, link it to, to the, what you call certificate. We also have uh, mathematics is also related, st statistic uh, is related to, to the certificate. So all that, the uh, assignment, for that kind of courses in the first year and second year is uh, a smaller part, smaller task from the big, what you call AI project. And, uh, you know, and at the same time, the assignment can be turned into a competition, a small competition just to uh, create interest for the student. So, X Tunnel from uh, the curriculum, there's a support system. You, if you look at the top right, we have student society leaders and uh, recognition that is dedicated to this, and workshop and competition, uh, 24 hours access to facilities that, so they can have a community that work together. We have industry mentorship and fund from grant training, consultation, support group activities, and office that manage this project uh, uh, to make it sustainable. So this is the ideal ecosystem for 
for uh, what you call industry infused. So how about uh, uh, we, what what do we have today? What what do we have now as in our program? So we can imp, uh, improve in towards this example. Yeah, we can dream like this. Uh, it might be you know too ambitious, but we can start somewhere. Yeah? And to make the program sustainable, the best is to infuse the activity in the curriculum. So all students will experience it, not only part, part of the students. I mean, it, what I mean is, if you want to create a competition, it must be part of the subject. It must be, for example, assignment and as a part of assignment. If not, some student will be left out and it will not be assessed. So how can we say they are competent if we don't assess whether they are competent or not. And talking about assessment, competency-based assessment, in the end, what do we check? We don't check whether they know the theory, just that. We, also, we More importantly, we need to check whether they can complete the task successfully on their own in a, in a designated time. Okay, so this is one example. Uh, for co-op education, this is a, a bigger example. So this is in the uh, University of Waterloo in Canada. Uh, the study term, you can see they have off study term. So a four-year program become a five-year program because there are uh, terms that they actually go to work. And it is done very loosely so they can work anywhere they want. There's no compulsory transfer credit, so they can uh, try to transfer their credit if it is related, but if not, then they just get experience. So it is suitable for those who want to get some money as well, so they can work, get some money, and use that money to pay the tuition fees for the next semester. You know? So this is one option. Another option is a very structured one, like in German. So I've visited this university, uh, Berlin School of Economics and Law. It's a Hochschule. It's a Hochschule. So uh, for every three months, they will alternate go to the university and then industry. So the dark gray is in the university. The light gray is at the company. So university, company, university, company, university, company. So they can, uh, you know, the, the curriculum is a is a bit planned. So so they are able to actually finish on time lah, three years, three years for this uh, what they call particular degree. <coughs> so it is interesting, yeah. And uh, in that university, they are working with seven hundred company, 700 employer, uh, and they all take, uh, I mean, student from, from the university. This is uh, what we are familiar with, 2U2I. So the 2U2I is a brand, but in fact, we can do it in the 2U1I, 3U1I, but they are all uh, part of the 2U2I brand and they can be arranged as such. So we actually have implemented this in UTEM, uh, in FTK and FTMK, I think FPTT as well. And this one we might want to explore in the future, apprenticeship. So what if we, what if the student actually being, uh, coming from a, uh, what do you call, a worker of a company, we have actually attempted this before, uh, I think FKP, if I'm not mistaken, is trying to do this and try to make it legal uh, from uh, uh, from uh, uh, what you call accreditation body point of view. Let's see if they are successful. <laughs> if you are for uh, your MQA, maybe it's easier, but for engineering, then maybe it's a bit difficult. <clears throat> What we see on the screen now is actually a framework. Uh, I actually lead this uh, study for, for the ministry. 
uh, to try to establish a framework for level six. Uh, we have uh, from level one to five, uh, but run at the Ministry of uh, what do you call it? human resource. They call it SLDN. Eh? Um, but even they just started maybe uh, 10 years ago, so it's still relatively new. So in German, this has been uh, around for a while. This is starting from, I think, the 70s at the, uh, what do you call, higher education level. And for the, what do you call, level one to five, they have started since the 1400. Even before industry revolution number one take place, <laughs> so it has been a lot a while, yeah. So actually, uh, people do apprenticeship as a natural way to learn back then. Nobody, we don't have any institution, education institution, uh, a long time ago, right? So, but how people able to become a fisherman or or somebody who make the ship even. They learn while working, right? So they start as a, you know, a beginner, and then they learn and work through the years. Over the years, they, they become uh, expert. And then suddenly we forget this concept. And now we want to try to do it again. All right, so I think it's about coming to the end. Uh, so. Uh, this is the life cycle of orientation. Yeah, sorry, uh, apprenticeship. And um, yeah, so I have shared a little bit on ideal. Care points and real might be, you know, later if you are interested. But ideal, I think, is uh, more relevant to us. So now we know, maybe we can practice. Uh, let's see, In a, it's supposed to be end of a part, but because we are already, uh, you know, the time is already limited. So I left this for you to just uh, read on your own. So this is just, I explained to you just the idea behind the part number three. So it's about um, how to actually design a curriculum that is competency based. Okay, that is relating to occupation. So this is how, and this one is actually a guideline, also lead by by myself. Um, this was published in two thousand eighteen, but the document actually um uh, it is an effort by the ministry to guide higher education provider on how to design. Uh, a TVET curriculum. So, as you know, TVET is very much work related. So, it is really suitable for Excel for an ideal, for ideal program. All right. So, there's a step like this, and it is taken from the concept of DASCOM or, or DACOM, uh, what, which is which means uh, design of uh, curriculum. Yeah. So you see here, we need to analyze the need of the uh, the job, the work, analyze the job itself, verify the task that is that is needed. We choose some of the tasks that is important and difficult to learn, and we try to transform it into something that in the form of learning outcomes. Yeah, and then uh, the rest is almost the same. But the first part, the first phase, the perancangan phase A. Uh, it's a bit different than how we actually develop curriculum for the higher degree. We often, uh, you know, refer to the to the field and see we're supposed to learn this theory and that theory, the body of knowledge, right? But now we don't have. Well, we start with not the body of knowledge, uh, or at least I mean we can have we can start with uh, looking at the body of knowledge, but we need to also look into the body of work or job. The body of occupation, what makes the occupation and the uh, occupation, what tasks are actually inside the occupation. So that is the idea. I think that's it. And 
the fourth part is on a lesson learned from the QI. And there are a study by the ministry to see the what you call what we can learn from the implementation of two to I so far. And we have this uh what you call uh action for the lesson learned that we can take. So number one is there must be a legal process that is uh, very efficient. So if you want to make MOU, uh, MOA, LOU, it must be very uh, seamless, yeah, the process. And, uh, uh, and almost automated, lah, kalau boleh. And then the, the process to result must be efficient. And there must be a strategy and ecosystem is tonight. For example, uh, when we deal with uh, the company Skyline, uh, we try to actually uh, look at a bigger picture. Okay, so not only they become uh, what you call the provider of the certificate, but also they get involved with all the aspects. Even after the student graduate, yeah, when they want to do master or PhD, they become part of the ecosystem. Can you can you imagine that? So, so you know our industry partner is really very close. So the strategy and ecosystem must be there. And in terms of uh, curriculum design, uh, the tips is your curriculum, our curriculum must be very, 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 very flexible. So they must be, in order to do that, we must have a lot of portion for elective. We try to maximize the number of credit for elective. So, so I think 20 credit will be good. 21 credit. So 21 over three, uh, seven subject. So this elective, uh, then you can try to match with the number of industry out there because it's impossible for one company to take many of our students. They can only take one, two student, right? So if our student go into uh, ten different companies, then how we want to what you uh, adjust? The ability of the experts in the industry uh, to to teach the electives, uh, to teach the, the course in the industry. So if we make it an elective, then it is a bit more flexible uh, and suitable for the needs of many companies and uh, what you call the change of technology. So it's so fast that we can actually always change uh, the course. I think that's it. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm sorry if I take uh, too much time. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, terima kasih banyak, uh, PM Dr. Fami. Uh, thank you very much for the for the talk. Then uh, before we end our session, uh, let have some questions daripada participant. Okay, ada soalan mungkin nak kalau uh, boleh on kan mic masing-masing and uh, just just say your, your question. Boleh? Kalau tak ada, boleh tolong typekan dekat dalam chat pun boleh. Saya akan bring out the question. Okay, ada siapa-siapa nak tanya? Kita bagi dalam beberapa soalan. Uh, kalau sebentar mungkin saya boleh tanya kerana satu soalan daripada PM Dr. Mama Azman. Eh. Uh, ini daripada awal tadi dalam pukul 4 tadi dia tanya. How uh, are you going to measure the experience? Because it's all about experiential learning kan? So, dia kata adakah ini sesuatu yang objek, yang subjektif? So, uh, macam mana nak measure the experience of, of this? I think, okay. I think students kot saya tak pasti. Mungkin PM Azman boleh tolong uh, clarify kan ke? Maybe. I try to answer from what I understand, hmm. how to measure experience, right? Okay, first of all, kita uh, boleh, uh, apa dipanggil tu? Uh, analyze what do we mean by experience by doing uh, step number four on the slide that I show you now. So kita pilih tugasan. So for semua tugasan ni, bila kita bangunkan profile competency dekat uh, step A6, we will actually try to see what are the KSA needed to complete the tugasan, to complete the task. What are the knowledge, the skill, the attitude, the ability that is needed to complete uh, the task that we identify at A4. For engineer, for example, if the task is to design, to design something, 
right? So we know the knowledge uh, to design something, there must be fundamental knowledge. Mm -hmm. There must be design knowledge. That is in terms of knowledge, right? In terms of skill, they can be in terms of using tools like uh, AutoCAD or, or for robotics like uh, robot simulator or for programming like programming, uh, uh, you know, integrated design environment uh, or the programming language itself. So that is the skill and the attitude uh, might be uh, whether they are meticulous, whether they are, uh, you know, their awareness of the uh, the need of the people is is there. So I mean, attitude can be many lah. So after we have done that, we turn it into a rubric. The kind B, kita start dengan B tiga, for example. Tentukan kriteria penaksiran, so it will be very uh, dedicated to the different K, different S, and different A that we have identified. And then we say we can have uh, two type of assessment. Number one, we assess the product or the output, whether it is finished or not, the quality of the output there. Yeah? Let's say we, are, we, we design a car, we look at the car, the car, when the, the car is functional and can work and operate. So that is one type of assessment, the assessment of the output. Another type of assessment is assessment of the process. So for competency-based assessment, we need to look at both the process as well as the output. So the output must work. If not, then we cannot say it is, they are competent because remember the definition of competence is able to complete a task, right? So the uh, the car must be able to to run lah. And how about the process? The process is when they do the drawing on the software, do they uh, do it uh, following the protocol? Do they consider all the necessary consideration? The pastel, for example. Uh, uh, when they design, do they actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the drawing, do they put tolerance inside, for example, uh, for communication with other people that work uh, for the project? So that way, then they can assess ex experience. So I think uh, I, I I hope that I answer your question, PM uh, Azman. Okay, PM uh, Azman, does that answer your question? Okay, all right. So um, any other question? That's what I'm looking for. Any other question from the audience? Okay, it's now almost four forty-five. Um, okay. So if if I may lah, uh, other parts of that, if I may lah, kalau ni kata kami ya, so. Basically, what I understand from Excel is basically Excel is macam satu, like a compilation of, of maybe a unified, we could compile some more best practices related to how to, to, to increase the experience learning based on industry, resilient, personalized, and put it into a, a landscape like a map. Isn't it? Macam tu, you're right. Uh, Betul. So it's yeah. nothing new. Yeah, actually. Yeah. So it's, it's nothing new. Basically, certain certain thing, a certain of these activities has actually still has really been running. But then it double aku kan dalam kita punya environment. But you are looking at the global juga lah from other universities. So you are compiling all these best practices uh, on experiential learning so that maybe Malaysia can can take up money yang dia sesuai suitable to be implemented dalam kita punya environment. Is that is that something that maybe that was Excel is trying to do? Yeah, spot on. Yeah, uh, yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay, okay, so, okay. So because it's a landscape, that's why it's called a landscape. Yeah, it's like a mapping lah. Maksudnya, mapping, mapping. You're, you're yeah. mapping all the things what's going on on the macro level. You're looking at the, at the aerial view what is going on, yeah. and you pick up and you you put into a framework. You package it into a, something that you call a ideal care, poise, and real. Is that something like that? Yeah, that's right. 
Okay, so it's something that okay, that's very good lah. I mean, uh, you this is a very very new, very new to us. I think benda ni pun belum launch lagi. They will be launched this Friday again for your initiative. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, they're not. <laughs> so Friday, probably, so... you are giving some preview lah. I mean, what is uh, the preview? Happen? That's why my presentation is a uh, change to to you know not covering all, but also just a, like a sneak preview lah. Okay, alright, alright. So now, now um, kita lagi faham dah sebenarnya apa the whole reason, apa tujuan ya. Yeah? Uh, we are listening to this Excel because kita nak tahu juga lah kan maksudnya instead of kita buat apa yang kita buat, now kita nak buat tengok macam mana how it relate to a bigger picture lah. Macam tu. That's eh? right, yeah. Okay. So Alhamdulillah. So any any other further question from from the audience before we end? Maybe give me one more, last one. Okay. So yang this, this uh, yourself uh, in, in involved in industrial development, ideally basically the 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 the, the documentation, all the punya framework dia dah, dah set up already dah, dah dah. Uh, mm, uh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, it will be turned into a uh, playbook. Uh, okay. So that is uh, what we are doing now. Okay. Uh, to be the reference for everyone lah. Okay, alright, right. Okay. So like like you said, uh, if we have it in in one book, then people can have options and they can become more creative. You know. Yep. And then they maybe can refer to uh, those experience to have experience lah uh, running the different type ni. So yeah, kita kadang, -kadang uh, uh, being a uh, Emton University uh, being uh, and our slogan is always pioneer, always ahead. There are many initiative that we actually uh, far ahead from our, uh, when compared to other universities. So they actually are referring to us now many many things. Mm. For example, you know CJ Professional kita yang pertama buat lah. Sebelum hmm. ni, uh, tak ada universiti lain yang buat lagi. Secara sistematik macam kita buat lah. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Okay, okay, maybe maybe one more thing lah. Maybe if I want to add, maybe in the future because uh, I think you, you remember dulu, maybe at one time, uh, like 2010 or 11, around that time, uh, you tell ada pernah buat satu program, we call it a GLAD program, a Graduate Leadership Assessment uh, Development Program. And it was especially uh, targeted a student yang katakan after dah nak graduate. It's a few months. It's basically the cerita pasal how to groom the students. Uh, uh, it create a simulation of a workplace dalam ni. Saya, I think that the day, I think Dr. Ridwan and Ridwan Nawawi dengan Dr. Zulisman, I think few lah, uh, some, some of our trainers. And I believe that GLAD program is is very, very, have, very impact very, very big dekat student. So maybe, maybe your, your uh, uh, ideal team or to maybe uh, uh, you can, can take a look back at uh, this GLAD program. Saya masih simpan lagi all the code, the materials, the modules and it's very structured and very very neat. Maybe just this cadangan sajalah kepada... Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Actually, uh, memang memang uh, ada dalam consideration tu. Uh, oh, because okay. our GLAD is actually under, if I'm not mistaken, under Perkeso. Oh, okay. That's good. Okay. Dia, dia punya bigger uh apa akta dia lah and then uh, okay uh, one of the uh, apa dia punya responsibility adalah untuk uh, padankan kerja lah berkaitan kerja okay uh, so um yes glad is uh, is a very successful uh, example and we just uh, want to extend it to so that it is infused in the curriculum lah not only not out of the curriculum Okay, that maybe maybe you can take off maybe during two T semester. Girl, these kids can be can be itu lah. Mungkin bila dah first uh. team itu lah. Okay, ada ada soalan lain ke daripada ni? Ah, uh, partisipan, maybe kita nanti malam sini tanya ke tanya dekat kita. <laughs> okay, alright, okay. Ah, uh, great. Kalau macam tu kita boleh wrap up. Batin pasal pun dah 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 lebih extra ni. Kita dapat extra kredit dah orang semua ni. So thank you for your patience. Eh. Semoga orang sini. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate that uh, you have uh, been patient to be with us. And thank you very much, Mr. Fami, for an eye-opening and a very interesting subject. Basically, this is something very new. Belum lagi rasmi pun, Mr. Fami dah rasmi kan. But actually, hopefully that we can take up certain points and maybe especially yang yang ni lah. Dia punya saya suka uh, the children learn what they live ni. It's something yang saya rasa maybe kalau boleh print out kita tampalkan dan kita boleh ponder upon eh. Because this one yes, yes. Untuk, untuk belajar, kita boleh apply this this uh, this this uh, poem, uh, how kita act to our students lah kan, PA students. Yes, uh, student, yeah. Betul. Yeah. Okay, And 
Thank you very much so, for kita sharing pun, uh, kita, Macam Dr. Maria selalu cakap lah, student itu macam children dia juga. <laughs> Yalah betul. Nah, betul. Siapa Jadi, yang dah rasa, rasa dah tua dia akan anggap macam children lah. Siapa yeah. yang tak, tak rasa tua dia anggap adik-adik. <laughs> dia bukan children dia, dia ada kucing lagi tu. Tu pun kena treat <laughs> macam tu juga kan, tahu tak? Okay, yes. we, we treat our, 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 our cat with uh, uh, hostility, dia akan learn to fight kita lah kan. Sama <laughs> juga kan. Not only people. Animal also act like way kan. Okay, so that's all. So wrap him up. Okay, so with that, I would like to thank you again. So before that, kita nak ada sikit uh, bergambaran, bergambaran lah, sesi bergambar. Eh. Minta semua peserta <laughs> untuk uh, switch on um, your camera dan kita boleh bergambar bersama-sama dengan kita punya dekan kita. Tadi masa mula-mula pun ada peserta tanya, oh dah lama tak nak dengar suara Dr. Fahmi ni. Dah rindu suara. <laughs> ni. <laughs> dulu masa PPPA dulu selalu kan, on the stage apa tu kan. Ha, sekarang ni <laughs> dah dekat fakulti dah tertutup lah fakulti dah tak. <laughs> But anyway, okay. Uh, Syam boleh take over Syam? Uh, InsyaAllah until next time kita jumpa lagi. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Have a nice day. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, Assalamualaikum.